Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's nice to be here um, talking about um, intertidal marine isopods. Um, my name is Warren. I may well know some of you, uh, if not in person, then online. Um, my professional specialism is in linguistics and English language, but in, in my spare time, I try to see as much wildlife as possible. And I'm particularly interested in isopods, whether that's wood lice or uh, marine isopods. And I'm going to talk about the marine isopods in particular today. Um, and it, it, you, you see up there on the top uh, left of the screen, the symbol for the British Myriapod and Isopod Group. So uh, I, I obviously I'm closely involved with BMIG and uh, we, we run the intertidal marine isopod recording scheme. And I'll talk more about that as we go on. But uh, please do have a look at the BMIG website um, and indeed join up as a member. It's free to join and there's loads of really useful information on there. And we do a, a field meeting every year and so on and so forth. OK, so let's let's talk about uh, intertidal marine isopods then. Um, just bear with me a second while I minimize something so I can see what's on my screen. Um, well, first of all, what are isopods? You're probably already familiar with with some isopods. They're, uh, they are arthropods in the subphylum Crustacea, as I'm sure you know. Um, so they're they're nest, nestled well within Crustacea. They're closely, relatively closely related to lobsters and prawns and shrimps and so on. Um, and the most familiar representatives of the um, the isopods are obviously the wood lice, which you know everybody's familiar with. Um, some of the common species, at least, you can see there in the picture, we've got uh, two species of wood lice huddled together. This is a picture taken in my garden in Edinburgh. We've got Percelio scaber with the little bumps all over it, and Aniscus acellus, the, the shiny wood lice. Um, and you can find out lots about uh, wood lice and indeed water lice on the BMIG website as well. And the, we've got a recording scheme running for, for those. Um, so any, any finds of those, please do record them as well. But there aren't just wood lice. Wood lice are part of the larger uh, order of isopoda. Um, and there are many different kinds of isopods of con considerable diversity in form and lifestyle. And most of them don't live on land at all. They live in uh, water environments, in particular in marine environments. So what are we talking about then? Well, we're talking about obviously the wood lice, which are part of the suborder on this idea. Um, there's 40 known uh, species of uh, wood lice occur in the wild in Britain and Ireland. Um, then we have the water lice, uh, the acelids. You may well be familiar with the, the, the common water lice or the, the water hog or whatever you want to call it that you'll find in ponds and so on. Um, and there are four species of those. And then we have marine isopods as well, all around the coasts of Britain and Ireland and the seas around Britain and Ireland. Uh, where do we find marine isopods? Well, they occur in all marine environments from the depths of the ocean um, to the upper salt marshes. Um, so right up almost beyond what you'd expect anything marine to be at there. At the up, you can find them at the upper levels of salt marshes as well. Um, now, when, when we think about marine isopods, um, there's a number of different zones, if you like. I mean, there are isopods which you'll never see from the shore at all. There are deep sea isopods, there are fully marine ones. So these exclusively sublittoral isopods, they, essentially they, rem they remain beyond the reach of most recorders. I mean, unless you've got a boat and survey equipment and so on, you're, you're never going to see them. Maybe some fishermen do and so on, but essentially they're beyond our reach. Um, but there are there are good numbers of marine isopods which occur in the intertidal zone, and those are the ones I'm going to talk about today, the intertidal isopods. In saying that, the, there's no strict dividing line between sublittoral and, and littoral isopods um, because many of them occur in both places and some of the sublittoral ones can occasionally be washed up on the shore so keep an eye out for anything unusual. Um, let's just look at a schematic diagram of, of what's involved in terms of the, the order isopoda. Well we've got our wood lice there with the 40 species in the suborder in Isidia. Um, you can see I, I've got uh, the sea slitter in the family Legia die there uh, in a separate branch. I'll come back to that. And then you can see we've got our water lice, uh, the, the acelids there in, in a separate branch. But you can see that those are only some small fragments of a, of a larger isopod family. We've got any number of different families divided into uh, various suborders and superfamilies and, and so forth. And I'll talk about, I won't have time to talk about all of these families at all today, um, and I won't be able to illustrate them all, but I'll, I'll try and give you a flavor of the kind of variation that we get within those groups and so on. I've labelled some there as internal parasites. So those those five families there um, are spend their adult life as internal parasites, and it means they're somewhat less accessible 
the survey work and so on. Um, so some people set those aside when they're considering intertidal isopods. I mean, some of them are more accessible than others, and I'll, I'll give you some illustrations of those as we go on. But there's lots and lots of species of interest here that you can, uh, some of which you can easily find on the coast, some of which take quite a bit more work. But I'll, I'll talk you through some of the details as we go as well. Let's just return then to the sea slitter. Uh, if I just click back to the previous slide, you'll see that I've put the sea slitter not in the wood lice. And traditionally, the sea slitter is considered to be one of the wood lice. I put it in a separate branch. Um, our only representative of the, the Ligia genus in Britain and Ireland is Ligia oceanica, the, the common sea slitter that you'll be well familiar with if you spend any time around rocky coasts in, in Britain or Ireland. Um, it's traditionally grouped with Legidium, um, the genus Legidium and the family Legiidae with, within the suborder Anisidae. But in fact, recent uh, DNA research suggests that Ligia is not a wood lice at all. It is an isopod, obviously, but it lies outside of Anisidae in the wider isopod family. Um, pretty hard to read that uh, genetic tree there. Um, but you can see Ligia is here and it's uh, Anisidae basically starts there and, and onwards. So it's it's out here amongst uh, this Phyromatidae and the Valvifera uh, isopods, which I'll talk more about as we go on as well. So you, if you if you think you've never seen an intertidal marine isopod uh, and you've only seen wood lice, well, you may actually have seen an intertidal marine isopod if you've seen the sea slater. So you're, you're already started. Um, so let's talk about then the, the British and Irish intertidal marine isopods. Well, there's around 79 British and Irish species, and that number is imprecise for a number of reasons. One is this distinction between subliteral and literal isopods is hard to maintain because um, there's no definite barrier between those two things. Also, species continue to be discovered. Um, Adam Jenkins recently added a, a species, for example, a parasitic species to, to the British list. Um, Clipioniscus, uh, one of the Clipioniscus species anyway. Um, so, the, the, the list may well grow further as people study further things and so on. Um, if you want to see the species that we have, the intertidal marine isopod species that we have, visit the BMIG website and there's a checklist of all known intertidal marine isopods there that, that have been accepted so far anyway as, as being identified in, in British and Irish uh, shores. Um, now of those 79, roughly 79 anyway, 19 of them are essentially internal parasites of other crustaceans. I'll talk a, a bit more about those as we go. Um, I say mostly because in their juvenile stages, they're free swimming, um, at least for part of their juvenile lives, but as, as adults, they're internal parasites of other crustaceans. Uh, there's a similar number of that 79, so somewhere around the 1920 range, which are essentially not really intertidal species at all. They're largely subliteral species, but can occasionally turn up near shore or on shore by accident and so on. But we include them in the list as possible. Um, and that leaves us around 40 species that may be more readily encountered intertidally. And some of them you will find pretty much every day you go to the coast. If you look in the right place, others you might find once in a blue moon uh, are not so easy to find and you have to be in particular places or use particular techniques or just have a hell of a lot of luck to find them. Okay. Um, now, if, if you've seen wood lice before, uh, certainly when I started looking at wood lice a number of years ago, I thought, well, they're just wood lice, they all look the same. Actually, when you look at wood lice a bit more closely, they don't all look the same. There's quite a lot of variation, both in size and shape and, and, and also in coloration in wood lice. Um, but the kind of variation you see in, in wood lice actually pales into insignificance compared to the amount of variation you get between in, uh, in marine isopods. They come in a wide range of shapes and sizes. Um, they occupy all sorts of varieties in the marine zone from salt marsh to kelp hold fasts and beyond. Um, Within Britain and Ireland, as is usually the case with, with many species, uh, diversity is higher in the south, in particular with isopods in the southwest, and it's lowest in the northeast, correlating with sea temperatures. And of course, I live in the northeast, I live in Edinburgh, so um, I'm in an area where supposedly there aren't um, very many intertidal marine isopods. I find some inter interesting intertidal marine isopods up here, though, so uh, no matter where you live, there's always something interesting to find. Um, it's it's worth um, understanding a bit about what isopods look like and how they're structured, so you can understand. You can you can start getting a handle on how we can go about identifying these things. Um, obviously, they they have features in common with other crustaceans, but they've got their own specialized uh, morphology, which is if not identical between the different groups, it, it it's replicated in similar forms across most of the groups. So, what have we got? 
Well, they're usually dorsoventrally flattened. Think about a wood louse. It's, it's not like a sand hopper, which is sort of laterally flattened. They're, they tend to be sort of tortoise shaped, if you like. Um, they're divided into a num we divide them into a number of segments. We divide them into the head, which has the eyes, the antennae, the the antennules in wood lice, the antennules are vestigial or disappeared entirely. Uh, in the intertidal marine isopods, the antennules are still there. And they have their mouth parts, of course, which are fairly complex, made up of, I suppose, evolutionarily various four legs and so on. Um, then you have the perion, which, if you like, is the main body of the isopod. And that has seven segments, each of which is a pair of legs, or periopods, as we call them. And then behind the perion or the, the, the main body of the wood lice, we have what's known as the, or sorry, the isopod, we have what's known as the pleiotelson, um, which is made up of up to five pleon somites or segments, uh, plus the plus the telson itself, the, the sort of the tail point, if you like. Um, and underneath the underneath the pleiotelson, you've got five pairs of pleopods, um, which are adapted for various things, breathing, um, copulation locomotion all sorts of things in marine isopods and they have two pairs of europods um, and each of these pleopods and europods have an inner one and an outer one an endopod and an exopod you can see here the endopods sorry the the europods are these sticky out things at the back if you if you've seen wood lice they've got sort of pointy things it's the same structure on wood lice and um, as we'll see in Marine isopods, they take a, a range of different forms. This is one particular form with these laterally placed uh, europods. Others are uh, different, different kinds of europods, and that's useful for identifying to family, and then, then you can take it further from there. Um, what else have we got? Um, other features, females have brood, pouch, brood pouches on their underside. So um, wood lice appear to give birth to live young. Essentially, they just ate the eggs and pouches underneath, and then the, the live young come out from the pouches. Um, you don't really get it so much in wood lice, but um, at least not not close, not not visible from a from a sort of a, a general inspection. But in um, many marine isopods, there's marked sexual dimorphism, with often the males having ornamentation or whatever that the females don't have. Um, and it becomes particularly important in some groups of marine isopods to understand the structure of the legs. Uh, you have to examine uh, various hair patterns or cetacean patterns on the legs. So they have the, the, the usual isopod structure of the basis, the ischium, the meris, the carpus, the propus, and the, the dactyl, uh, starting with the basis obviously nearest the body. Um, you'll, hear, you'll see me referring to some of those as we go on as well. Um, I'll talk more about it as well, but there's consider considerable variation in the size and shape of and, and, and of the layout and manner of the various body parts of uh, marine isopods as well. So let's have a look at some of the variety that we get from intertidal isopods. And here are just some hand-drawn diagrams from Ernst Naylor's um, key to the marine isopods from 1972. I'll talk more about uh, guidebooks to the marine isopods in a minute. And you can see they come in a dizzying array of different shapes. You can see they look a bit wood lousy at times. Other times they don't look so wood lousy and so on. I mean, uh, this one looks a bit like a wood louse. This one looks a bit like a wood louse. This one looks like a water louse. Not surprising. It's from the same super family. This one, what does this even look like? This thing down here, it doesn't look like any, any kind of isopod at all. And this one looks more like a spider and so on. Um, so there's a lot of variation in shape and size. There's all, in terms of size, they range from less than a millimeter. I'll show you one, for example, that's about half a millimeter in length, a picture of one that's half a millimeter in length, right up to 50 millimeters. We don't get the giant marine isopods that you get in the Caribbean or in the Pacific or whatever. I don't think you get them in British waters at all. Um, so 50 millimeters is where we top out in terms of our size. And to be honest, the, the specimens of that species are usually smaller than that as well. Um, as I say, they're coming all sorts of different shapes and sizes, including ones that roll in balls, much like the pill wood lice, which you may well be familiar with. We get pill marine isopods as well. So that's that's one of the pill marine isopods there that you can see in the middle of the screen. Others have lost isopod characteristics. Those are the typically the um, the parasitic ones. So this is a female parasitic isopod here, and it's lost more or less all isopod characteristics that you would normally associate with them. Um, I'll talk more about how we identify um, marine isopods as we go on, but just thinking about some of the key features to look out for when we're trying to work out what we've got or how to identify them. 
one of the most obvious distinct distinctions is what, what their habit is. Are they parasitic or are they non-parasitic? And that divides them essentially into two uh, groups, and then we can work from there. Also, their habitat, it, it's, not, it's not always the most definite of things, but certainly habitat can point towards the kind of species that you're likely to be dealing with. Uh, you know, if you're in, an, in a salt marsh pool, there's only two or three species you're likely to find there, maybe even one species, really. Um, their body shape, size and number of legs. We'll see, for example, that although isopods typically have 14 legs, seven pairs, some types don't have that. Um, the shape and the arrangement of the uropods, these these things at the back are, are quite important. You can see here are the uropods on this little one here, here are the uropods on this one. Um, here are the, the uropods on this one, but this one doesn't seem to have uropods because this one's uropods are underneath its pleotelson. Um, the segmentation of the pleotelson is also important. You can see we've got segments here and here, um, and you can see different divisions of the segments. We've got uh, no segmentation here and so on. D different kinds of segmentation um, points towards different families. And then once we've um, gone beyond that, you're looking at details of the body shape, the, how, the, the length of the antennae compared to the length of the antennules, uh, often cetacean patterns on the periopods or legs. You can even look at mouth parts for some identifying features and so on. Some of these features are microscopic. I'll talk about the extent to which you need to do microscope work to identify uh, isopods as we go on as well. You can go a long way without using a, a microscope, but there are certain species you obviously are going to need to do that. Oh, that's the next slide, in fact. So what do we need to do when we're examining intertidal isopods? Well, uh, here you can see me at work, uh, nicely posed while my wife take, takes a photograph of me here. Um, in order to identify intertidal isopods, you're going to first of all need your isopod. I'll come on to how we get the isopods in a bit, but you're going to need to examine them quite closely. So you're going to need at least a, a times 10 or times 20 hand lens to have a proper look at them. Um, if, like me, you're at your eyesight starting to go a bit as you get older, you're going to need a pair of reading glasses or even a pair of um, sort of magnifying glasses, if you like, um, to allow you to see smaller ones in the field. Um, it's often useful to place the isopod in a tray or a pot to have a proper look at them, uh, because like, like all wildlife, they try to escape whenever you, you look at them, some of them more slowly than others. Um, photography is really important for identifying and recording. I mean, uh, when, I, when I'm assessing isopod records on iRecord, for example, if there's no photograph and if I don't know who the person is, there's no, there's no way of being able to tell what the record is, how accurate it is or anything. And that's not a comment on the person's ability to identify a thing. It's just simply I have no means of verifying the record. So photography is really important. So please do photograph your stuff. Um, <coughs> often that will involve macro photography of one description or another. You can get pretty good shots of isopods if you place them in a dish, for example, a Petri dish. Um, what I tend to do, and you'll see lots of photographs as we go along of isopods, I stick them in a Petri dish and a bit of seawater. I place that Petri dish on a gloss black tile that I bought in b and I put a bit of water on the tile and set the Petri dish on it and squeeze the air out between, and it provides a nice black backdrop to take photographs uh, of the isopods. Then you just have to worry about them sitting still and so on, but some of them are a bit more compliant than others that way. Um, so yeah, get your photographs if you can, and then, then uh, we can actually say something about the isopod you've got. Um, in terms of working with isopods and, uh, and so on, and, and collecting them and, and picking them up and so on, everyone's got their favorite um, ways of doing these things. I tend to use a fine paint, paintbrush, a sort of a double O paintbrush I find extremely useful for picking up isopods, big ones, small ones, anything else. They often grab onto it as you, as you touch them with it anyway. Um, and that allows you to manipulate the specimen and move it around and put it in a pot or whatever it might be. Other people use little pipettes to, to suck the isopods up. I, I do that sometimes, but I don't find it as useful. If in doubt, you lick your finger and pick them up off the rock. I found myself out on a family trip one day in Berwick-upon-Tweed, and um, I hadn't thought about doing any isopoding, and I found myself looking at the estuary thinking, I bet you there are isopods just there, and I, I, I could do with collecting some here because I haven't surveyed the, the Tweed estuary. So I took my shoes off, went down in the rocks, had a pot in my pocket, I never went anywhere without a pot, but I didn't have a paintbrush, so I just dampened my finger, turned over a rock, dampened my finger, and dabbed a few little isopods that were under it into the pot. And when I got home, I discovered I had two different species that I collected that I hadn't recorded in that location before, which is pretty nice. Um, in some cases, it's going to be necessary to examine specimens under a, a dissecting or even a compound microscope. 
Um, some of some isopod species are ma many of the intertidal marine isopod species are less than half a centimeter. Some are only a few millimeters. And in order to identify them, often you need to look at small characteristics of them. You need to look at, as I say, cetacean patterns on legs and so on. And so you're going to need to do some microscope work if you want to identify some of the many, not many, some of the isopods and indeed some of the commonest ones you'll find uh, require you to do a bit of microscope work. To, uh, for, in some cases, this can be done with live animals in a tray of water, but usually it's necessary to preserve them in 70% ethanol solution, as you would, for example, with wood lice. So they're soft bodied creatures, you, you, you can't dry them out like you would with beetles, for example. Uh, so this is me working on the mic microscope and up here, what, what have we got? We've got the underside of a, of a marine isopod, uh, Edutea baltica, one of our commonest uh, intertidal marine isopods. They grow up to about 30 millimetres, usually a bit shorter than that. But it's not just one isopod. I took this one home for examination and what was on the other underside of it? A tiny little white oval thing. And I, when I saw this, I, I almost did a little dance with joy because this was what I was hoping to find. This is a really highly under-recorded little parasitic isopod called Clipionyscus hansini, which has only been recorded in a few places in the, uh, around, around Britain. They're probably really common, but nobody's spotting them because the, the adult males are half a millimetre long. The, the, as I'll explain uh, as we go on, many of these parasitic isopods are protandrous hermaphrodites. The, the, they're, they're, when they're young, they're males. The first male that gets into the body of the host becomes a female and then subsequent males remain male after that. And so this is a male that hasn't entered the body and become a female. Okay, so in terms of identifying isopods, you're gonna need, uh, you're gonna need a guidebook, okay? And the, the, essen the essential guidebook to the intertidal marine isopods of Britain and Ireland is the Linnaean so Society's synopsis by Ernst um, Naylor. Um, the second edition, uh, by Ernst Naylor and Angelica Brandt is the, is the one to get if you can. Um, it's got the up-to-date classification nomenclature and so on. Um, I don't know if you can see my screen and my face on the screen or not, but I'm waving that book around here as well. Okay, you can pick that up online. However, the first edition of that by Ernst Naylor on his own is available freely online through the Natural History Museum. You can get a PDF of it. And it's essentially the same. It's got some old names for stuff and the arrangement's slightly different, but the keys in there are the same and the species that are covered are the same. So it's essentially the same guide. So you can get that for free to get you started at least. Many of you may well have the Handbook of the Marine Fauna of Northwest Europe. And in that there's a chapter by Ernst Naylor as well, which gives a key to the marine isopods of Britain and Ireland or Northwest Europe, essentially. It's the same, it's the same group of species. Um, and um, it's the same key, essentially, as the as the Linnaean Society one. It's just a pared down version of it, a little bit simpler. There are some minor differences, which I'll maybe come back to. Um, the problem is that th these the, the 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 Linnaean Society synopsis is, is brilliant. You can't do without it. None of these guides, however, has all of the known intertidal species from Britain and Ireland in them. Um, one or two species have been discovered since, and their treatment of the difficult, um, really common Lacanosphera uh, genus isn't isn't quite perfect. The the Linnaean Society book leaves out one species. The Handbook of the Marine Fauna of Northwest Europe leaves out a different species. So between them, they don't cover the, the full range of species. I'll come back to other sources as we go on as well. So I talked about family characteristics before, and this is essentially a a very simplified key to the families of the intertidal marine isopods uh, in table form. Identification of family is pretty straightforward, uh, based mostly on lifestyle, numbers of periopods, the arrangement and shape of the uropods, and the body and pleiotelson shape. So the, the big divide in the key first is between ones which are internal parasitic, and there are five families of those getting further with those. Often you're relying upon the host, the host species to, to Give you further information as to what you've got. But then moving to the free living and external parasitic isopods, they divide into two groups, those which have only got five pairs of legs and those which have got seven pairs of legs. Now, isopods normally have seven pairs of legs, but there's one family, the Nathiidae, which have five pairs of legs, and they're, they're unusual looking things anyway. Uh, you can't really mistake them for any other group. Uh, within the, seven, the, the ones with seven pairs of periopods, then we look at the shape of the uropods, and the uropods are those sticky out things at the back. Remember, I said the pointed things in a woodlouse, for example. Well, they're positioned in various places on the body, 
Some of them point out the back, just as they do in wood lice. Uh, for marine isopods, that takes you to the the acelids, the acelota the superfamily or suborder, sorry, um, that includes the water lice, the freshwater lice. Um, in some, in the superfamily or, or suborder Valvifera, the uropods are ventral, i.e. underneath the pleiotelson, you can't see them from above. And then for a group of families, the uropods are lateral, they stick out the sides. And then the body shape comes into play and the number of pleon segments, that's the number, not, not the main body section, but the, the rear part of the body, how many segments are there before you get to the, the telson at the end. So some of those families will have five, so might uh, one of those families will have less than five and so on. So you can see, you can, you can narrow down to the species, sorry, to the family fairly easily. And then once you're in the family, you're usually only dealing with a relatively small number of species. And the, the key in uh, Naylor and Brandt will uh, help you get to species after that. Now, in terms of identifying uh, marine isopods, what are we talking about in, in terms of difficulty? I mean, I, I made the, what, what I discovered was a crazy decision a couple of weeks ago to try and identify some ants. And ants appear to be an absolute nightmare to identify, not just because you can't control them, but also because they're hard to identify. Um, isopods are, for the most part, rather easier than that. Um, if you are familiar with identifying wood lice, then most isopods are of a similar difficulty to identifying wood lice. Some of them present a bit more difficulty than that, but by and large, you know, a, a good, decent photograph from above will identify a, a lot of the species, not all of them, but a, a lot of the species. Okay, a good close view. Some species groups are rather harder. So the ubiquitous Jera uh, group of species, that's the some of the ones I collected at Beric upon Tweed I mentioned to you just before. There are five species of those uh, five common species of those. There's also one extremely rare species which hasn't been reported in decades, so it may no longer be in Britain or in Ireland. Um, and it was only ever recorded at, at Wembury and in, in Cornwall anyway. Um, those species are everywhere and they're massively under-recorded and yet they are relatively easy to find. They're not ridiculously hard to identify, but you have to be able to preserve them dissect them and they're, sm they're only small they're only up to about three and a half or four millimeters so you have to be able to remove legs from them and so so forth and examine them under a microscope so you can see there uh, here are some examples here's uh, Jaren Nordmani and this is the underside of the pleotelson the rear end of a male you can see the uropod sticking out the back and here we've got something that looks a bit like the shape of a necktie and that's the male reproductive structure, the preoperculum, and that's distinctive for the species. You don't need to dissect that any further. If you turned upside down and you can see that through a microscope, you know that's the species you've got. Um, this is the sixth leg of a male Jera albifrons sensu stricto. Um, these, there, there are four species which uh, of, of Jera, so once we exclude the one that's probably extinct in Britain. And once we exclude Jera Nordmani, we've got four other species and they can only be distinguished by looking at male, the sixth leg of males and sometimes the second to fourth leg of males as well. Um, you can see this species is extremely distinctive though if you if you go down to that level of detail. On this segment of the leg, which is known as the carpus, you've got this bulge which comes out with little hairs on it and that's not found in any other species. I mean, most of them just have it. I'll show you another example in a minute, have that straight across and you can't mistake that for anything. You can sometimes see this on a live creature if you can get it to sit still, which is not that easy because the Jera species are, when you put them in a pot, they go crazy and munch each other and stuff, so they don't sit still for very long. Um, the genus Lacanisfera is another common group of species that they're very similar to Spheroma. They're pill isopods, pill marine isopods. Uh, you can just about work out the difference between Spheroma and Lacanisfera visually. It's not always easy, but you can kind of get an eye for it once you get used to them. But within Lacanisfera, there are four species, and you can really only distinguish those by dissection. Um, and here's one of the, the four legs of a uh, Lacanisfera rugicada, which is the typical one you get in salt marsh pools. But you can't be sure of that unless you look at it under a microscope. And then you're looking for these little CT on the on the propodus near the end of the propodus, this segment of the leg. And that is really hard to see through a microscope, but it's 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 how you identify those. So that, that's that's the stiffest challenge really for uh, the marine isopods, I would say. Other genera are not as difficult as that, but they do require you to have a really good close view, preferably through a dissecting scope, even if it's just of a live animal. Um, something like the, the Nathia species, Eurydice and Limnoria, you do need a really good look at those. Um, 
especially Eurydice, are often encountered by people swimming in the sea or, or looking in rock, rock pools and so on. And um, people submit photographs of Eurydice, and they're almost certainly the common species, um, but you can't know for certain without seeing them close up. Okay, so I mentioned the, the, the essential guidebook, which contains keys and diagrams and, and, and species descriptions before the, the Naylor and Brandt book. But there are there's other resources you can use to help you as well, especially considering that the the Linnaean, Linnaean society synopsis doesn't include all the species and doesn't treat the Lacanosphera genus as, as well as it as it might have done. Um, the first place to go is the British Myriapod and Isopod Group's website. Go and have a look at the BMEG website. Um, you'll find loads out about not just about uh, marine isopods, but also about wood lice, uh, millipedes, centipedes all sorts of stuff. There's a huge amount of material on there. It's really useful and, and do join up if you're interested in those groups. Um, in terms of the marine isopods, you can see a, a species list for all of the recognized intertidal species um, uh, around Britain and Ireland there, each of which comes with a description. I'm adding photographs as I go. There's some information on where to find them and, and, and so on and so forth and some references and, and, and whatnot. Um, on that website, you'll also find a brief guide to finding intertidal marine isopods. I'll briefly give, give you an introduction to that on this talk as well. Um, there's a guide on there to how to go about identifying the Jaira species, those little tiny but very common species that require dissection in many cases. And if you're interested in going down that route, I would advise you to have a read of that page because it takes you through step by step the process you need to do to, to come up with a confident identification of those. Because the, the, the key in Miller and Brandt gives you the details of cetacean patterns and everything, but this is a little practical guide how to, how to go about getting to that point of identification. And then we have a Facebook group, a nice active Facebook group, Isopods and Myriapods of Britain and Ireland. Go on there and I'll be on there and people like Steve Gregory and so on will be on there to give you advice and help with wood lice, millipedes, centipedes and marine isopods, poropods, some phylons, anything at all. Okay, so have a look on there. It's a, a very friendly, helpful group. Um, if you're interested in seeing what's involved in the practicalities of finding some species, some species. I've put together some short videos on YouTube. You can go and have a look at me trying to find Edithia granulosa, which is our commonest large intertidal marine isopod, fairly easily found. But of course, when you stick your video camera on, you can never find these things. But you'll see that um, I do find some. I also have a video there showing me finding some gribbles. That's the Limnoria species. Um, it's Limnoria lignorum is the common one that we get around all the shores of Britain and Ireland. You, you need to find wood with their, their typical sort of boring pattern in it if you want to, if you want to find those. Um, have a look at the video. You can't see the, the creature very well in the video because it's little and tiny. It's only about three millimeters, but it gives you an idea of how to find them at least. And then there's a video of me finding the interesting little isopod, Campocopia hirsuta down in, in South Devon. If you want to see some utterly fantastic photographs of uh, marine and intertidal isopods, have a look at David Fennick's uh, A Photo Marine website. Um, some amazing photos on there. David, David's done some lovely work. Um, and much more besides uh, marine isopods as well. There's a whole load of stuff on there. I highly recommend that as a guide to seeing what these things look like. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to take you through just some of the families, looking at some of the characteristic species and some of the things that are some of the things that typify these groups and, and so on. Uh, I'm not going to, as I say, going to have time to talk about all the different families, but I'm going to pick out some of the commoner families or the families that you're likely to find. And so indeed that I found, I haven't seen all the intertidal marine isopods by any means, especially not the parasitic ones. Um, so let's have a look at what we've got. And I've, I can't give you photographs of all the species, but I've given you some illustrative pictures here as well. So let's start off with these weird little isopods, the Nathiodai. These are largely benthic isopods, although the Paragnathia formica occurs in estuaries and salt marshes. They only have five pairs of legs, which is unusual for an isopod. They're a very unusual shape, not just with that, uh, but in other ways as well. So, for example, the adult males have prominent beetle-like mandibles um, and, and sort of square heads. They don't look isopody at all. They look, they look like, I don't know, some sort of beetle or something, um, but not really either. Females, on the other hand, um, and, and the the juveniles have bulbous bodies. You can see a picture here. I think this is a late stage juvenile turning into a female that I found in southwest Scotland on the edge of a salt marsh in Kirkubrishire. Um, so this is a, 
the juvenile stroke sub-adult female paragnathia, paragnathia formica, about five millimeters. I mean, look, look what you've got. Ignore the big blob in the middle. Here's its head and here's its pleotelson. Those bits look isopody, little eyes, segments, segments. But then you've just got this big sort of bit that looks like a, a swollen grape or something in the middle. Okay. Um, and what, what happens with this species is that the males burrow little tunnels in mud banks and they guard a harem of females. Um, and then at some point in high neap tides, I think, the tunnel fills with water, the females burst open and the young escape out. And, and so you have the next generation. And then the young go off and parasitize fish and then come back and the process is repeated. Maybe one of the, the more familiar um, intertidal marine isopods is Eurydice pulchra. That's this beautiful little thing, up to eight millimeters. They they can they're not always common, but they can be really common uh, on sandy beaches. You may well have encountered these when you're swimming in the sea or pottering around at the coast, especially over sand on a rising tide. You you can see Eurydice pulchra. Uh, Eurydice pulchra. They, they they have been known to have a go. Actually, they they will nibble at you. It doesn't do you any harm, but it can feel a little bit like a prick. You know, as a, like you, not a sting so much as a little nip. Um. And they can be really common, but other times you can struggle to find them and clarity of water obviously helps. I am um, anytime I'm visiting the coast, whether it be to look for isopods or not, I always have a, a little pot in my pocket. And indeed, I've been swimming with my kids in the sea and inside my swimming shorts. You know, there's a little pocket in the inside of the swimming shorts. I keep a little plastic tube in there and I have captured your dice while swimming with the kids in the sea. So it's always always worth being ready because you never know what you can encounter. The species above that is a species known as Serolana cranchii. That's um, a bigger um, isopod from the same family, the Serolanidae. Um, these are mostly sublittoral. They generally aren't encountered in the intertidal zone. But I was in South Devon a number of years ago, and um, I was just turning over some stones at low tide. And there was one of these just sitting on the underside of a stone. It was fantastic to find that. It had been just after a storm. Storms can blow up things from, from deeper water into the intertidal zone. So certainly worth looking out for in southwesterly shores. These are more common as scavengers on, on, in lobster pots and things like that. That's where they're more likely to be found. Um, the, here are some of the, the freakiest uh, of the marine isopods, and these are the chemothiodi. Um, these are ectoparasitic isopods on fish, and they include a number of uh, species which are becoming in, increasingly well known in British waters. So the, the Analocra species here, we've got the, the photograph at the bottom uh, taken by Steve Trewella. Steve, you may know Steve does some fantastic diving work and diving photography. And, He's got some uh, great photographs online and he's got a nice book showing loads of intertidal wildlife and so on. And here's one of his pictures of um, Analocra parasitizing. I'm not sure what that fish is, but they, they usually parasitize corkwing wrasse. I don't think there's a corkwing wrasse here. Uh, these grow up to 50 millimeters. There are two species of them, but even under a microscope or a close examination, it can be difficult to determine which species it is. It may be that the two species integrate and there's no definite distinction between them. They, they're like the other. Um, Parasitic isopods, they're protandrous, protandrous hermaphrodites. They start life as juvenile males, and then the male attaches to a, a fish and becomes a female, and then subsequent males remain male and may mate with the female and so on. And the, the adults spend their lives stuck on a fish like this with their claws in them. You can get males free swimming around before they attach to fish or whatever as well. Look out for them when you're snorkeling, diving. You can get them in fish in rock pools, so they will occur in the intertidal zone. You can get them if you're catching fish and so on. Do look out for those. But so far, they've only been recorded on the south coast of England and in the Channel Islands, but they may well be spreading north. We're not sure. A similar species that you're probably not going to see quite so easily because it's rather rare, more rarely reported and probably a deeper water species is Norosula or Binyi. Um, this one was photographed and taken indeed by Robin Soames in Southampton Water. I think this is a sand smelt, I think he, he said to me at the time. You, you can see the analocra attached at the front and the rosula attached near the rear, and they've got different body morphology and so on. Uh, a really fantastic species to see as well. And then the freakiest of them all, of course, is Serratothoa steindachneri, the, um, the tongue biter. We have one tongue biting species in British waters, possibly Irish waters as well, although there are no reports from there yet, as far as I know. And these live in the buccal cavity of lesser weaver fish. Um, you've got to be careful with lesser weaver fish because, of course, they've got a very nasty sting. But if you're lucky enough to catch one of these, whether in a net or on a rod and line, 
that's a good thing. Have a look in their mouth if you're in Cornwall, Devon. Uh, even then, this one was found uh, in the Isle of Dogs in the Thames Estuary. You, you may well have Ceratothoa steinbachneri, and the male and female live in the mouth of fish. So, and when I opened this fish, had obviously been preserved, as you can see. When I opened this fish up, uh, the female was here, and the male was sitting behind her in his mouth. You wonder how the fish was able to feed around them at all. Fantastic things, amazing, and you know, over two centimeters in size as well. And like a, a lesser weaver fish isn't particularly big to begin with. Then we have our ball rolling intertidal marine isopods, this is Um these are, these are reasonably easily encountered. And apart from the Lacanosphera species, they're reasonably easily identified as well. The Lacanosphera, as I've already said, require examination of the front periapods to, to be able to definitively identify them. Um, one of the most common species you'll encounter is Dynamine bidentata. If you're on southern or western shores, you, you should be able to find that species relatively easily. I'll come back to, to it, but the easiest way to find this species, other than turning over rocks, is to um, go down to the low tide, grab a handful of serrated rack and wash it in a bucket and then sieve the contents, and you may well have Dynamine bidentata in the bucket. That's a really easy way to find that species I've discovered. Um, several of these species have um, marked sexual dimorphism. We can see here Dynamine bidentata. The male has these two horns growing out of the of the sixth segment. Here's a female who doesn't have that. She's just got an indent in her pleotelson. Uh, here's another species, Campacopia hirsuta, and the male has got a long single spike out of the sixth pleon segment. Uh, the female doesn't have that, um, and so on. So those are really distinctive species. And here we've got one of the Lacanosphera species, Lacanosphera rugicota, which is really common in salt marsh pools. Have a wander around salt marsh pools, especially ones with grassy edges, and just spend a while looking in them, and you'll see some of these swimming about. It's pretty much my experience, no matter where you are in the country, that you, you, you will see some of these. But as I say, the identification is a bit trickier. Then we have maybe the most obvious of the marine isopods, that's the Edithia species and related genera. So. Um, these are really obviously isopody like they've got that elongated slater like look they're often common so the most commonly encountered larger intertidal marine isopods are editia granulosa and editia baltica um which you know don't look dissimilar to this top one they look reasonably similar they're fairly often fairly large and fairly obvious you find them under stones amongst seaweeds swimming in shallow water at low tide and so on and so forth so what have we got here we've got editia pelagica um, the best place to find that is amongst barnacles and um, small mussels on exposed places where the seaweed can't even grow. They seem to like these really exposed rocky shores. You can find them there. Not always that easy to find, but you can find them there. Down at the bottom, we've got Editia linearis. This species is really big. It goes up to 40 millimetres. How do you find Editia linearis? Well, I've discovered that how you find Editia linearis is with a lot of patience. You have to wait till it's a really low spring tide. You have to find a sandy beach and you have to wade around in the water in the sandy beach up to your knees or thighs for as long as it takes until you see one of these swimming about in the water. Sometimes you're lucky and you find one soon. Other days you go home and you haven't found any, now, which is the case with all the wildlife, of course. But that's a really nice, impressive species to see. I mean, I say that about finding Editia linearis, but I continuously see people online saying, what's this funny thing I've found as I've been playing with the kids in the sea? So some people just find them by accident without having to do much work. And then here's a really striking species as well, Stenosoma lancifer, um, which grows to over two centimeters. You can see it's this deep red color with this sort of jaggy edges and um, this elongated uh, pleotelson that looks like a, a fountain pen nib. Um, these are restricted to southern shores, southwesterly shores. I, I think I show, I'll show you a map of those as we go on in the presentation. Really nice to see. These are really, really low tide species. If you want to see Stenosoma lancifer, unless you're very lucky, what you need to do is get a really low tide on a south or southwest shore. Um, go right to the edge of the low tide to the red seaweed zone, maybe wade out to your knees or thighs and sample some red seaweeds, wash them in a bucket, and you may well find some of these in there. Uh, that's been my experience at least. So that's the Editia dye. Um, then we have the Limnoridae, the, what are known as the gribbles. We've got four gribble species, or sorry, three gribble species in Britain and Ireland, the most common being Limnoria lignorum. These are small little isopods, sort of fun little dudes who spend their lives boring in wood, uh, which is all very well and good for, for us uh, looking for wildlife, but it's a real pain if you're trying to build a pier or have 
keep a boat from getting rotten and so on because they will chew and gnaw their way into anything, even, even tar treated wood. It used to be the case that they recommended that you looked in wood pilings and so on, piers and so on to find gribbles. It's not always that easy to, to find or access wood pilings anymore around the coast of Britain and Ireland. What I find is if you can find driftwood that's stuck in rock pools, that's where you'll find gribbles. So, you know, driftwood that's washed up in the beach and gone back in the sea is no use because the gribbles will have died. But if you find anything that's got stuck in a rock pool, sometimes you're lucky and find it just in the water as well. But anything stuck half under a rock in a rock pool, you may well find gribbles in. And they do this characteristic boring in, boring along the grain of the wood and then that collapses and then they do it again and again and again. So you get this characteristic gribbling of the wood as they call it. Um, uh, just a couple more group families to look at before I move on to other things. We've got the Genairidae, and these are the ones that are closely related to the water, the freshwater water lice. Um, so these include the, the Jairus species that I've talked about. Here's what you'll see if you turn any rock over in the intertidal zone, especially on the hard surface. You'll see lots of these little Jaira shuffling away from the exposed side. Uh, they're only small, up to five millimetres off and quite a bit smaller. One of the most characteristic of those species is Jaira Nordmani, which is much more circular than the other species and has distinctive reproductive structures. And you'll find these under stones at fresh water outflows onto rocky shores and, and so on. That's, that's where you almost always find those. Um, as is, I've shown you already, leg, leg cetacean patterns are really important for identifying Jera. So here's Jera first money. You can see this is the sixth, the sixth periopod with a great big spike rather than a bulge here. And then the second to fourth uh, periopods have these occasional curved hairs. And then here we've got a spectacular species, Genera maculosa, up to 10 millimetres, common on southern shores in certain conditions, and I've not quite pinned that down, but possibly after storms as well. Occasional elsewhere, I find this one in East Lothian in, in South East Scotland, for example. And then we have finally our parasitic, internal parasitic isopods. And of course, the problem with internal parasitic isopods is they live inside other things, and as a result, they're hard to survey. And to be honest, you often don't want to survey them because you've got to sample the host population and euthanize them and look inside them and so on quite often. So that's really the only way you can study them. So uh, in some ways, they lie beyond the, the, the interests of, of many people because they don't want to do that. But if you are going to look at them, there's a number of species which are more easy to see than others. They, they parasitize barnacles, marine isopods, and other crustaceans and so on. I showed you the little Clippiniscus hansini before. This one was in the underside of an uh, of, of an Edithia isopod, half a millimetre in length. This is a male, but you can see up close it looks like an isopod. This is one of the easier parasitic isopods to find. It lives inside uh, barnacles, the common acorn barnacles. Um, and this is Hemianiscus bolani. This is a female, and you can see it doesn't look like an isopod anymore. It's got a little isopod face and little isopod front legs. And if you look at the other side, it's got a little isopod butt as well. But otherwise, it's just become a sort of a big flaccid sack of eggs and not much more guts and so on. Uh, how you sample these is uh, you scrape some barnacles off using a paint scraper or something like that, and then you have to examine the barnacles. You can preserve them first if you like, examine the undersides of the barnacles, and you'll see these in with the barnacle under the shell. And here's a really striking isopod. These grow up to uh, over a centimetre. This is a Felges paguri. These um, parasitize hermit crabs. So uh, inside, inside a hermit crab shell, here's the abdomen of the hermit crab. And here's the big flaccid female. You can see the, the just about see the legs, but she's turned into a big egg sac, essentially. Here's her pleotelson here. And look, here's a little male who looks much more like a normal isopod close to her rear end. You, you, you always get a male accompanying these, these particular type of isopods. Um, the parasitic isopods have these complex lifestyles of living inside and outside animals at various stages in their lives, and they also have this really strong sexual dimorphism with the males retaining the isopod look and the females turning into some sort of shapeless or less obviously isopod thing. Okay, so let's just hurry on then. How do you find isopods? Those are some of the families. How do you find them? Well, as I always say, identifying isopods is easy, but sometimes it's much harder to find the things. Some of them are really common, but a lot of them aren't that common and require a lot of looking for to get them. So some species are common. Um, where do you find them? Well, you find them pretty much everywhere in your intertidal zone. You find them in salt marshes, estuaries, sandy beaches, rock pools, under rocks, and seaweed attached to fish in wood and mud and other crustaceans, etc. Rocky shores with seaweed are probably most productive. Some species like a bit of low salinity. The state of the tides is important with some species only found at the lower tidal limit, especially low spring tides, as I've said. So 
if you're interested in coastal wildlife, you spend half your life looking at tide timetables and cursing because it coincides with work or coincides with darkness or whatever it might be. And you sometimes can only get a low, a low spring tide that coincides with a weekend once in a blue moon, but those are special times when they happen. Um, of course, then you get to the coast and then there's a, stor there's a storm out at sea and it's actually pushed the tide in a meter higher than you thought it was going to be, which can be a bit heartbreaking too. But these are, these are the, the, the shakes when, it's, when you come to coastal wildlife. Low tides obviously uh, allow for more searching time. I should at this point say, if you're going to do anything intertidally, you need to be bloody careful what you're doing because it's really treacherous. You can fall, you can drown, you can get stung, you can break your legs and so on. Be careful at the coast. Um, things like weather, season and time of day can also be really important, although they're very much more difficult to predict what effects those are going to have. So here's a couple of pictures of me. Here's me at Tinningham and the East Lothian coast turning over stones. My wife took these pictures. Here's me at Remore Head at Port Rush in County Antrim. This is one of those occasions when I was in a family day out with the kids, but I had some stuff with me in a bag and I left the kids with their granny on the beach and me and the wife headed over to Remore Head Point and I got the trousers off and started rock pulling and found three species there that I hadn't seen in that area before, which was quite nice. Um, as the tide was rising, I just about got in before it covered the, the interesting parts of the tidal zone. How do we find intertidal isopods then? Well, there's various techniques for finding isopods that um, you're going to want to utilize and the, each different technique will uncover different kinds of species and different people have their preferred ways of doing it. And there are more technical things you can do and so on as well. But here are the general techniques that, that you'll find that you'll use over and over again. So just as you would with wood lice or, or many other organisms, turning stuff over is a good way of finding, finding a, a, intertidal isopods. They like to hide, obviously, from the sun and so on. So turning stones, seaweed and other debris. This is particularly useful on hard surfaces. You'll rarely find anything under a stone sitting on sand or on mud in many cases, but if you if a stone's sitting in a, on a on rock in a little bit of water, that can be productive. If stones among seaweed are productive and so on. Even, you know, sorting through seaweed, turning it over, it's a bit boring, but you can find stuff underneath it as well. Um, you can find a range of species in this way, quite a, a good range of species. One of the most productive ways of finding intertidal marine isopods is washing. And what does washing involve? Well, it involves having a bucket. You can see me there with my fishing bucket there, 20 litre fishing bucket. And you half or two thirds fill it with water and then you get stuff and put it in the bucket and give it a good wash, whether that's handfuls of seaweed, rocks, gravel, mud, etc. And then you sieve the results. You can see I've got my plastic kitchen sieve there and you stick the, the debris that's left in a tray and you'll see your isopods swimming around in the tray. Sometimes you have to give it a bit. Some of the species sit still for a, a minute, but most of them flutter around fairly quickly. You can find various species doing that. It's really a really productive technique for finding isopods. Digging and excavating in mud and crevices in lichens, barnacles, wood, etc., will provide you with a range of species as well. And you may want to wash some of the bits and pieces you, you dig, dig out and so on as well. You can also use traps. I don't do that so much. I have done a little bit of it, but um, Steve Trawella, for example, has done some light, tra light traps on the south coast and he's got amazing things in some of those traps. Um, you can use baited nets, baited pots, light traps, and so on. One of the most interesting things that's been discovered is, um, and again, Steve Truella, I think, is one of the people who's talked about this online, is that um, if you're on south or westerly coasts, you can sometimes get lobster and crab bait pots washed, these orange scotty pots washed over from North America. And uh, you may be tempted to clean the beach up and put them in a bin. Have a look inside because you can sometimes have a species that's washed over from the northwest Atlantic, Editia metallica, inside them because they enter the little holes as juveniles and then can't get out as they grow bigger. So have a look out for those if you're on those shores as well. Parasitic species you find where their hosts are. So if you, if you want to find those, you need to find the hosts. Uh, and obviously, when you're doing any of this stuff, you have to try and minimize your impact on the environment, including the isopod populations. And watch out for local restrictions. Some places you're not allowed to pick anything or disturb the environment hardly at all. So just be aware of local restrictions. What equipment do you need then for, for collecting isopods? You don't actually need that much. You, you know, that picture in the top right there is essentially what I carry out with me most of the time. Um, you need a bucket. I use a 20 liter one. It's big enough to hold all the other stuff. So you only have one thing to carry. Um, it's big enough to wash stones in and so on. Um, you need a specimen tray. I, that, 
that specimen tray there I've got is it's just a, key, a cheap cat litter tray and it, it's really useful because it fits inside the bucket. A plastic sieve, kitchen sieve, and a, you'll need nets. I mean, I've got one of those fancy nets you buy for far too much money online. I don't use it half as much as my goldfish net. The goldfish net there for a couple of quid out of a pet store does the job often as easily. Fine paintbrushes I've, I find indispensable and I'm constantly breaking and losing them. So you need to find a cheap source of double zero paintbrushes. Pipettes can be useful. Small spades are often very useful and paint scrapers are useful if you want to get barnacles or anything like that. You need specimen pots and containers. You're going to need a hand lens. Pen knife can be useful, especially if you're looking for gribbles and wood. Um, diving gloves are one of the more essential things because if you're turning rocks and you're not wearing diving gloves, your fingers will be in tatters before very long. So and, and get infected afterwards, as, I, as I've discovered far too many times. So wear diving gloves if at all possible. Save yourself a lot of pain and hassle. Sometimes you'll need a small hammer and chisel. I don't use them that often, but sometimes you might want to use them to get into crevices and so forth. For examining species more closely, you're going to need a camera, preferably one with a macro lens or some close zoom, zoom apparatus at least. A binocular dissecting microscope becomes necessary if you want to carry things a bit further. Sometimes a compound microscope will be necessary as well, for example, looking at the legs of Jera species. Um, and you, if you can mount your camera on your microscopes, that then will allow you to take the micrographs you need for record purposes and so on. You need all the usual stuff, glass specimen tubes, petri dishes, slides and so on. Um, in terms of preserving, the, the, what you want is 70% alcohol. And if, if you don't have ready access to industrial alcohol, the easiest way to get to get it is to go to B and Q to the um, to the fancy fireplace department. Maybe they're outdoor fireplaces. I'm not sure, and they sell bioethanol in liter or two liter bottles, and it, it's it's been tested and it's it does the job for preserving stuff really really well. Mix it three parts to purified or deionized water. I just buy it in Halfords or anywhere else. Um, and then write your labels in pencil and stick them inside the tube so nothing can get mixed up. Then it comes to recording your finds. Um, if you're going to find this stuff, you might as well record it as well. That's what it's all about. In the end of the day, we're trying to add to knowledge and, and find out about these organisms. So it's the usual things apply with recording. You want to find out, we want to know who's found it, what the thing is using the scientific binomial name where you found it, including the microhabit, the vice county, six-figure grid reference, location name, and so on, when you find it, how you find it's often useful information as well. Photographs and micrographs for verification are essential these days. Um, think about it, uh, looking back at records from 30 years ago, you've no idea whether those people were right on with their uh, records or whether they weren't. In 30 years' time, they won't know whether we are or not. Um, so you have to take stuff from the past and trust, but if there are photographs attached, you can say, yep, that person knew what they were doing. Um, they, 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 that's a record that we can rely on and so on. Retain your specimens. If you've collected specimens for close identification, uh, retain them in alcohol, uh, build up a reference collection so you can refer to it or provide voucher specimens if need be for identification and so on. And make sure to submit your records. The British Myriapod and Isopod group runs recording schemes for centipedes, millipedes, and wood lice. And in 2020, we launched or perhaps more accurately, relaunched an intertidal marine isopod recording scheme. There used to be one back in the late 1960s and early 70s, but it, it, it petered out. We've relaunched that, and I'm in charge of that recording scheme. So please do submit your records. Stick them on iRecord. It's the easiest way to get them. You can email me as well. Um, records do get sucked in from iNaturalist as well, but preferably through iRecord. Um, and if you add a photo and so on, there's a good chance we'll be able to work out what the species is, or at least uh, give you the genus in, in some of the more difficult cases and those are fairly quickly processed and they go then again fairly quickly into the NBN database and they appear on the atlas and you can see the difference that you can make with recording look I live there this species is essentially unrecorded around most of Britain and Ireland this is Jera Ischia Sotosa and I've recorded it in pretty much every hectare in southeast Scotland so how can you contribute then? Well, we don't know that much about the distribution of intertidal marine isopods. We've only really got broad geographical indications. Just to give you an example, prior to my work in Southeast Scotland, I live in Edinburgh, so prior to my work in Southeast Scotland, there are only a handful of records in Southeast Scotland for nine intertidal marine isopods in Southeast Scotland on the NBN database, right? You're only talking about a dozen or two, less than two dozen records. Since 2017, I've added many more records of those species and recorded a further 14 species in that area. So we're talking basically between Edinburgh and the English border here. Um, 
And I found most of those species in multiple hectares, some of them in all the hectares that are in, in that area. Okay. In that, and in, that includes some species that have rarely or ever been recorded in Eastern Britain. And it, last October, I was visiting a remote part of the Berwickshire coast indicated by this little arrow here. And I found a single, in a barnacle scrape, I found a single species, a single specimen of a female Campocropia hirsuta, which is a southwesterly species, as you can see from the distribution map. What on earth is it doing up here? Is it an accidental one? Uh, you know, is it a vagrant? They are sea creatures, so they can get swept around. Is it more thinly distributed across the around the shores of Britain and Ireland? We just don't know. So you have got a, an enormous uh, ability to add to our knowledge of what's out there if you if you go looking for intertidal marine ice pods. Here are some more maps just showing you distributions. So this is Thena soma lancifer. Remember that red one with the the pleiotelson that looks like a, a fountain pen nib. You can see it's restricted to the south and southwest coast of England, but is it in South Wales? We don't know. Is it in the south coast of Ireland? We have no idea. What about all these gaps? Is it there? I'm pretty sure it is there, but it's just not been surveyed closely enough. Here's a really common one, Dynamone bidentata. The squares are historical records, which weren't, uh, weren't hectare records. They were sort of 50 kilometer square records. But you can see the, the more modern records, the dots you can see from Kent the whole way up to Shetland with one outlying record on the Berwickshire coast. Again, that's not one of my records. Um, I haven't found it in the area yet. But you can see from this Northern Irish coast, I recently found it there at Port Rush. In fact, in that photograph, I was finding it as, as, as that photograph was taken. Um, it's probably right around these coasts, but we don't know because the work's not been done and we don't know how far it extends up into East Anglia or anything else. Okay, so that's me finished. That's a brief introduction to intertidal marine isopods. I know I've gone on probably more than briefly, but anyway, that gives you a flavor of what they look like, how to identify them, how to find them, and so on, how to record them. So, yeah, any questions, very welcome indeed. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you for that, um, Warren. That was actually amazing. I never realized we had so much diversity. Like, they're really cool. And when you said, oh, they look a bit like beetles, I was ready to be a bit offended. But actually, I'm totally down with that. Like, they are amazing. Um, because we have gone over time, what I'm going to do is going to just fly through some questions. If you can just, like, whack out the answers and we'll get through as many as we yeah. can. Do you want me to stop sharing my screen? Um, yeah, you can do that. You can yeah. see your beautiful face. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, cool. So let's go. Um, Okay, um, Lauren asks, what do marine isopods eat? They eat anything and everything. Different species will eat different things. So a lot of them are detrivores, seaweed, munchers, and so on. Um, some of them will be feed in the benthic zone, eating whatever there is there, sort of detritus in the, in the, in the mud and so on. Some of them are scavengers. They will eat uh, dead, dead animals and so on. Others will take live prey. And, and so forth. And then, of course, the, the parasitic ones live on the juices of whatever they're parasitizing. So different species live on different things. A lot of them are vegetarian, but some of them aren't. Some of them are scavengers. Some of them will capture all their animals to eat and so on. So off the back of that, um, we've got another question, which is what ecosystem services do they provide? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, they, they obviously fit into the environment in some way. What in, in terms of provide, that's that, that's a little bit like suggesting they've got a purpose. But they 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 they're there to 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 live and breed. They live. They're there to eat whatever they find that they like to eat, and they provide food for other things. So they're, they're an essential part of the environment. Actually, I mean, what function they provide, I don't know. But they will break stuff down. Just like if you if you have a compost heap, it's always full of wood lice, and that's wood lice are one of the things that break it down. So intertidal marine isopods will break down seaweeds and so on and so forth similar sort of situation brilliant um sarah asks um what weather conditions are more favorable for collecting marine isopods yeah well that's a good question it depends upon your tolerance <laughs> i i would highly recommend you don't try looking for them in stormy weather because stormy weather is dangerous at the coast and um, after storms is good a good calm day when it's not blasting with sunshine to burn the top of my head and make me too hot is, is, is the best thing, where everything's not too glaring as well. A dull, a dull overcast still day is the best day on the coast. I'm assuming things like spring tides and stuff kind of help a little bit as well? Spring tides are really, really important for low, lower zone species. The problem being that they only come around every so often every fortnight or every month for the really good ones and every six months for the really, really good ones. Um, and often they coincide with darkness or with work time or whatever. So yeah, getting a spring tide is a special thing, but it doesn't always happen. But yeah, you want low tides to give yourself a chance to find stuff. 
um, as a similarly follically challenged person as as myself, um, I totally agree that um, you've got whack loads of sun cream on your head um, when you're out on the shore because otherwise oh, you're wear a, 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 a colour. Wear a hat. That's what. Yeah. You're <laughs> Definitely. I end up putting stuff in my hat though. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've just a just a shout out really, and um, we've had lots of people from um, abroad. Um, we've had um, Marion um, from Canada, who is just saying that she didn't realise her little potato bug has such varied cousins, which is awesome. Um, yep. I'm pretty sure I saw a reference to Ohio in the chat earlier, so that's awesome. Wow. Um, we, oh, we've got some other things as well. So um, Terry, who is a uni lecturer in North Yorkshire, wonders if you have any data that you want crunching um, for his students to um, work on. Um, would you recommend he just contact you via Twitter? Yeah, you think he can contact me, yes. Yeah, beautiful, awesome. Um, well, um, have you? Are you aware of any um, issues or things like climate change that might affect them, or do you think that marine isopods are generally quite resilient? I think marine isopods are one of the species, one of the groups of species that will help us to understand things because they're often reliant upon sea temperatures for their distributions. What? Yeah, we. It, it's not proven that that climate change is affecting their distributions yet, but it would be highly unusual if sea temperatures aren't are rising, that it's not affecting them. So for example, we have seen in the last couple of decades, the spread of the Analocra species into Southern British waters where pre previously it was hardly known. The spread of the Ceratothoa steindachneri, the, the tongue biter, it's gone from being non-existent in British waters to being found in Cornwall to now being found in Kent, for example, that seems to be spreading. Um, I find that Campocopia hirsuta in Berwickshire, it shouldn't have been there. Is that something to do with warming sea temperatures? We don't know, but we won't know if we're not if we're not surveying these things and finding their distributions and comparing them to previous known distributions and so on. So I think they're actually a really important group for understanding climate change and sea warming and so on and so forth. Brilliant. Um, Roxanne asks, are there any difficulties with sexing isopods? Is it easy? Is it clear cut, or is it a bit of everything? Uh, for for quite a few species, you can't tell unless you look at their undersides closely. And when you look at their underside, for many marine isopods, they've got a, the males of a pair of pins, little sticky out things, as you could imagine. What those are, um, and those indicate the male, the difference in the male and female. Um, but you need you need to look through a microscope or have strong hand lens to see that. Um, they're not as often not as easy to, to identify the sexes as wood lice because wood lice have got these different structures underneath it. You can see with a hand lens. Sometimes with with marine isopods, it's not quite as easy as that. But some of the species are really easy because they're they're really sexually dimorphic, so you can tell what's a male and what's a female just by a quick glance, if you know what I mean, from the outside. Awesome. Um, cool. We've got two more. So um, Stephen just asks: um, Is do you believe that there might be a large hidden and undescribed diversity of an internal parasitic species? Do you think they're under-recorded or not being recorded at all? Yeah, parasitic species are extremely under-recorded for obvious reasons. I mean, if you want to discover the diversity of parasitic isopods, you've got to collect a lot of hosts and kill a lot of hosts and take them apart and so on. And it's not very many people do that at all. Um, one of our academic is marine isopod researchers in Britain, Adam Jenkins, um, is looking into diversity of marine isopods and he, he has suggested there are, if not many, at least quite a few unknown or unrecognized so far uh, parasitic isopods that just haven't been, haven't been found yet in British waters or haven't been verified in British waters, but which are probably there. Brilliant. Um, and my final question is, have you done any work on trying to separate the Jera species, females? Yes. Uh, do, did you say the females? Um, it, it says that, yeah. No, uh, from what I understand, you can identify Jera Nordmani just about from the other four common species just by the look of them, but you're, it's better to have a male to have a look at the underside of. So that one aside, you're left with the four species which fall into what's known as the Alba Franz group, and you can't from anything I've, I know, you can't identify the females. You can only identify the males. I mean, of course, there, you, you may be able to identify them genetically, of course, and so on, but that's beyond our abilities. Brilliant. Um, cool. I think questions-wise, that's me all done. Um, we have one person. Uh, it was Terry with the um, students. Um, he was saying he doesn't use Twitter. Is your email address um, available on the uh, recording scheme page? 
Yes, it is. Ideas. My email address is both on the presentation on the recording team page, or just type my name at the Google and you'll find my web page. Amazing. Well, on that, um, I'm going to say good night to everyone. Thank you so much, Warren, for this. It's been really, really good, a beautiful cool. resource. Um, we will be. Um, uploading this and putting it onto YouTube probably early next week. Um, and then a link will go out through um, the Eventbrite bookings that everyone's had, um, and they should be able to access that straight away from there. So um, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to end the call there, but you are welcome to unmute and say thank you very much to Warren if you would like to. Great stuff, Dan. Thank you very much for having me. No worries. Always a pleasure.